So let's begin, everyone. Hi, welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific, to everyone who is joining us on our live stream today. We have our last Team Science Cafe for this year. I'm super excited to get um, talking a little bit about our fish, Antarctic fish, and things of that nature. We've been working hard for this event, and so I'm so glad that you're able to watch and join us for today. We have some really exciting people to come and talk to us today. And we even have some friends in the room who have joined us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're always welcome to come back as well. And we have a really cool opportunity at the end to play a little game. Um, but for those of you who are joining us online, again, I just wanted to say welcome again to our Teen Science Cafe program. I'm going to invite our teens up to give a little bit of introduction as to what we're going to be talking about today and a little bit about fish, what they are, um, and that's going to set us up perfectly for Dr. Kristen O'Brien to come and speak to us about her amazing research down in Antarctica. So thank you again for watching, joining us today on our live stream here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Thank you for joining us in person as well. And we are going to get started. I'm going to introduce Ditya. Thank you, Ditya. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ditya Suratawaya and I am a part of our Teen Science Cafe here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Oh, my bad, I forgot, okay. So here, this is just a little bit about who we are here at the Aquarium. Um, we are the Teen Science Cafe. We're a group of teens who come together and we communicate with scientists and invite them here at the Aquarium of the Pacific to come speak about their research and what they do. And yeah, that's just a little bit about us. So these are some of our past events that we've had with these women in science in Antarctica. So our first event that we had was with Dr. Amy Moran. And she talked about pycnogonids, or benthic organisms more generally. So benthic organisms are organisms that sort of live on the sea floor. And she really went into detail on, yeah, Antarctic pycnogonids, which are pretty much sea spiders in Antarctica. And so our next Teen Science Cafe event, that was with Dr. Margaret Amsler. And she talked about pelagic krill and how they are a keystone species. And finally, we had the, our most recent Teen Science Cafe was with Dr. Roxanne Beltran. And she talked about Weddell seals. And, how, and she really went in depth on how they're able to adapt to their environment and how they're able to insulate so well using like blubber and fur and just yeah, how they're able to stay warm. OK, so this is an activity that we like to do here at Teen Science Cafe to sort of start off and end our presentations. And this is a turn and talk. So the first question that we have for you guys is, what do you think makes a fish a fish? So you guys can turn to the people next to you for about like 30 seconds, a minute or so, and you can discuss what you think. All right, everyone, so would anyone like to share what they talked about? Come on, ra raise your hands. <laughs> How about you guys right here? Calman, what's your name? Mariana, nice to meet you. Fins. Wow. So this is actually one of the biggest components that defines a fish's structure. So that's a great answer. Anyone else? We'll have our uh, buddy in the back. Gills, yes. So, you know, fish, as you know, do not breathe. Um, well, actually, some do. Um, but most fish um, do breathe underwater. And so um, they need gills so they are able to take in that oxygen that they need to, you know, have their own processes and systems to work. Anyone else? I saw a hand that was up earlier. All right, my friend in the front. They live in the water. 
Yes. So uh, my friend just said that they they live in the water, and that is absolutely true. That's one of the key characteristics of a fish to be a fish. All right. All right. So our next question we have for you guys is: Do you know a favorite, or do you have a favorite species of fish? And even if you don't know the name for it, that's okay. You can try and describe it. Fish are pretty cool. So, yeah. Okay, guys, let's bring it in one more time. So, who wants to say something? <laughs> uh, our buddy in their back? A, sorry, I couldn't hear you. A lionfish. Well, I have something, one star for you about that. Um, that's a great answer. A lionfish is very, um, it's one of the species that do, that share characteristics that uh, we are looking for in a fish or an animal in general. It shows camouflage, um, its own defense mechanism, and it's a great species that show how they have adapted into their own environments. Anyone else? Yes, my uh, friend in the front. Swordfish. A silverfish? Swordfish. Oh, swordfish. <laughs> yes, so um, swordfish is also display a great defense mechanism as their, um, their, what do you call that? It's kind of like, Sword. <laughs> the, the sword. The sword, yes. Um, and that that really defines the characteristics of what a fish is. They all have their unique abilities. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. So what is a fish? Um, well, we listed a couple of characteristics, but what, what more can we dive into? So... I want you guys to kind of look at these three fishes and see if there's anything in common or that you see that they have shared together. My buddy in the back. They have the same color. Um, yes? So they do have a similar color, and that is that's one of the characteristics that they have. And so, um, as you see, they're also my um, my buddy in the back. He has brighter colors. You can kind of see that they're a little bit different, even though these two are the same color. This guy might be a little bit darker because he's going to be found near the rocks of the um, like of a kelp forest or um, downward steeper, and he wants to camouflage, right? And my buddy over here, oh, oops, sorry, go back. Um, um, my buddy over here is a tropical fish, so he wants to be a little bit brighter, a little bit smaller, so he can get to um, all those hard places you can't get to when you're in the coral reefs. All right. So, can you name three other characteristics that you know these guys might have in common? It's a little bit harder. Yes. Yes, they all are water animals. I'd hope that they aren't going to be found outside of water. Um, but yes, so you, you might be kind of confused, like, huh, th they're really different. This is a wide variety of species. And this guy right here, do you guys know what this is? Yes, it is a seahorse. And this seahorse is actually a fish. He has all the key components. He has gills, he has a tail, he has fins, and he's able to use that tail to latch onto um, like branches in the water, plants, and he is able to sustain himself that way. Sharks, really big animals, right? But they're also considered a fish. They have all the same key components, a tail, a fin, and they are huge. 
And so what they all really have in common is a vertebrae. And we will dive deeper into what that is in the next slide. And our last guy over here, you guys mentioned lionfish. And yes, he is a fish. And you can see how his camouflage helps him in his own scenario. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Madeline, who will talk more about what a vertebrae is. Um, so as Jay, Jay was mentioning, they all have uh, vertebrates. So you guys might not know what a vertebrae is, but it's basically those circular bones that you see here. And um, it's part of the class of Chordalum phylum, which is right underneath the category of kingdom. So you might not understand what that is yet because it's pretty advanced biology, but basically it means that it's a, it, it has a lot of different species who have vertebrates. So some species who are in the Chordalum phylum are mammals like us, fish, obviously, um, reptiles, and many others. So I'm going to ask you guys, how many vertebrates do you think a human has in their neck? It's an odd number. I'll give you that little hint. OK, uh, yes, you in the black. Very close. They have seven. So. <laughs> <laughs> you had, so what about in a giraffe? Uh, yes, you over there. Um, think a little smaller. We'll get one more guess. So uh, yes, you in the. Uh, they actually have seven also. So last one, a blue whale. How many vertebrates do you think a blue whale has? Uh, yes, you in the black. Yes, they have seven vertebrates. <laughs> so, okay. The green one. I see. Okay. So they also all have fish. All have gills. So many of you um, might not know what a gill is, but it's basically their lungs. So fish use their gills to get dissolve oxygen which is in the water, in the ocean, and that's how they breathe, and that's how they stay alive. Um, so they use many small blood vessels to uh, distribute the oxygen into the rest of their body. Um, and as you can see here in the bottom right corner, there is a picture of their gills. Uh, it is a branching organ, which I find really interesting. And um, yeah, so I'll be passing it over to Kate. So fish are actually ectotherms, and we don't know. So ectotherms, let's break it down into two parts. Ecto. Ecto basically means outside, and thermic means heat. So if we put those two together, that means they get heat from the outside. And so they get more. <laughs> their internal heat is influenced by their habitat. This basically allows them to conserve their energy and use a lot, utilize it for more, something more important. So. A specific fish that actually does not follow this uh, adaptation is the opa fish, and they're actually warm-blooded. So let's talk about their habitats. So we all know that fish live in water, but actually there's some fish actually live outside of water. So like mud skippers, they live in the mud and they're able to burrow in, in the mud. This also goes for epaulet sharks, which actually which live in tidal pools. So an organ that all fish have is a swim bladder. Swim bladders allow fish to regulate their buoyancy. So if they want to rise to the top, to the surface of the water, they're able to incorporate op oxygen into their swim bladder and float up. But if they want to go to the bottom of the ocean, they're able to release the oxygen and sink to the bottom. However, not all fish have swim bladders. There's cartilaginal fish who do not have one. And examples of those are rays and sharks 
And instead of oxygen, they have oil-filled livers to maintain their buoyancy. I'll be passing it off to my friend Erica. Alrighty, so before we can hear from our scientists, we just have a few more topics we want to make sure you guys are familiar with. So it's time to bust out our Antarctic fish starter pack. First up, we have water and oxygen. So a cool thing about water is that cold water has more oxygen than warm water. And there's three reasons why. So first, higher temperature means more energy. In hot water, the water molecules are moving really fast, bouncing all over the place. And, when, and they can collide with the oxygen molecules and bump them out of the water. Second reason, some of the oxygen that's in the water, uh, when it's hot, can get enough energy to become a gas and dissipate out. Last, um, oxygen molecules can form weak bonds with water molecules, and when it's really hot, those bonds will break and the oxygen will be um, released into the atmosphere. So in cold water, the opposite is true. There's not a lot of energy, the molecules are kind of staying in one place, really densely packed together. So not only is there a lot of extra space for oxygen to hang around, but it's also more likely to stay in there. And what this means today is uh, we'll be looking at, at Antarctica, which has really, really, really cold water. And that means that there's a lot of dissolved oxygen available for the animals that live there, such as the Antarctic ice fish. Um, this species of fish is a fish what we, that we'll be looking at today. And you can find them um, kind of you know, living, do, living their life in the Antarctic seas. As you can imagine, it's a really hard environment to live in, but these fish have a lot of really special adaptations that allow them to thrive in the icy, cold, oxygen-rich waters of Antarctica. And we'll get to uh, hear a lot more about those adaptations today from our scientists. Lastly, we need to talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a really important protein that's found in, the blood, in, the, in your red blood cells in your blood. Um, they're full of, this protein is full of iron, which actually gives your blood its red color. And what it's responsible for is helping to move gases around your body, specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide. So every time you breathe, the oxygen in your lungs will um, attach that hemoglobin, and it'll carry it through the bloodstream to all of your cells and tissues that need that oxygen. And then it'll also take the CO2 from those cells and tissues and bring it back to your lungs so you can exhale it out. All right, and now I'm going to pass it on to my friend Zoe. Okay. Oh, let me. Oh, hold on. We have a little bit. Okay. If you remember our turn and talk from the beginning, we're going to go ahead and close that off now. So. First question, what is one thing that you learned from this presentation? Your favorite fact of the day. You can go ahead and think about it and talk to your neighbor, and I'll give you a sec for that. Okay, now would anyone like to share their favorite fact? What have we learned? Yes, go ahead. Some fish don't live in the water, yes. Now a lot of people think that all fish have only gills, but like mentioned before, mud skippers and some other species can do just as well on land for just a small amount of time though. Anybody else wanna share their favorite fact? Yes, on the front, hemoglobin. And what did we learn about hemoglobin? Right, and for us humans and most animals, it's actually red, which will be relevant later on. And the next, oh, did you have a fact that you wanted to share? Right, isn't that so cool? When we bleed, it's red, but keep that in mind for later. And next question, what is the favorite fish species that we discussed today? Yes? The mudskipper. So it went from lionfish to mudskipper. <laughs> Very fun. Yeah, those guys are super interesting. Yes, in the back? Hemoglobin. 
yes, sharks are fish. So they have all the requirements that are needed to be a fish, like mentioned before. They're just really big and a little bit scary. And does anyone have any questions about this presentation? Any fish, anything that you wanted to mention? All good? OK. Thank you. OK, so again, thank you all for sharing your answers and responses, some really cool things. You know what? We always think that we know everything about fish. We're at an aquarium. We are at the Aquarium of the Pacific, so we should all know about fish. But there's a lot of different exceptions and a lot of things that we might not expect. For example, we saw the epaulette shark up there, and it kind of walks on the land for a little bit of time to get from pool to pool. Didn't think that fish could walk, but yet here they are, right? You, we might have thought that fish, uh, they used to breathe water, right? But they're really breathing oxygen in the water. So we're not too different, right? So that's another thing, huh? And they have a whole swim bladder in themselves to keep them going up and down through the water column, or some might use other things. But interesting facts about fish, we're always learning about fish. Even us as scientists, we're discovering more every single day. So for those of you who are watching at home on our live stream, please don't feel like you're not involved. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can always send them in to us and ask. It could be the, wo the world's hardest question in the world, or it could be the easiest question, which is, what is a fish? And we will respond and get you that answer or connect you with someone who does know that answer. So now we're going to shift gears after we've learned all about ice fish and hemoglobin and all of these things, what makes a fish a fish? We're going to talk a little bit about Antarctic fish and what's going on down there with them. And I wanted to welcome up Dr. Kristen O'Brien, who is a researcher down in Antarctica. So please come on up and give her a big round of applause. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kalem. I want to send a big thank you to Kalem Watson and to all the students that are part of the Teen Science Cafe. The seminar series we, is really about you guys. Um, and you know, we hope that as you learn more about Antarctica, that one or more of you become excited about it and think, wow, this is really interesting. I can see myself doing that. And then you, too, will become a scientist traveling to Antarctica. We need you. We need bright, smart, creative, energetic, students that are interested in Antarctic science. There's so much to learn down there. And I also want to first also start by thanking all of the students that have worked with me over the 18 years that I've been uh, working at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And, and these are just a few of the students that I've had the opportunity to work with. Students are really the backbone of research. They're the ones that are home right now in my lab working on science. And I, it has certainly been an honor and a privilege to travel to Antarctica, but the greatest joys that I've had have been working with students, sharing the thrill of discovery with them, and helping them to achieve their goals. And I'd also like to thank, I've had many great colleagues over the years, and especially uh, Dr. Elizabeth Crockett, or Lisa Crockett, who I, we worked with to help develop this seminar series, and who has helped and uh, collaborated with me on, on the work that I'm going to talk about tonight. OK, so I came uh, down to sunny California here from, uh, the from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, which is uh, just there in the dead center of the state. In fact, it's called the, the Golden Heart City in Fairbanks. Oh, I did something wrong. <laughs> OK, yes, yeah, so this is what uh, the University of Alaska in Fairbanks looks like for about three days of the year. Most days, it looks like this. <laughs> As I was telling some of the students that uh, received a text message this morning that it's snowing, we're having a big heavy snowfall, and the power went out. I was like, oh, well, it's uh, nice and sunny down here. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so a, a fun activity that students like to do at the university when it gets cold especially is to stand out in front of the temperature sign alongside uh, this ice sculpture of our mascot, the Nanook or the polar bear. And yes, it does get to be minus 49 in Fairbanks. So it's a great way to help me get acclimated for work in Antarctica because I go to Antarctica and it's mm, warmer. 
So at the University of Alaska, I teach. I teach introductory biology. I also teach cell biology. I conduct research on uh, fish that live uh, up in Alaska, three-spine stickleback, which I was very pleased to see. You guys also have some three-spine stickleback here in the Aquarium of the Pacific. And I also travel down to Antarctica and conduct research on Antarctic fish uh, that live there. So I'm a fish physiologist and biochemist, which means I, I want to know what's going on inside a fish. And I'm especially interested in how they make changes to their environment, how they adjust as the environment changes. I may be biased, but my favorite fish is the Antarctic ice fish, one of which is shown here. This is the oscillated ice fish. Oscillated me means eye-like, so they have spots on them that look like eyes. Um, okay. In the Southern Ocean, surrounding Antarctica, really lives a spectacular assemblage of fishes, some of which I'm showing you here. Most of them are found nowhere else on Earth. They're extremely well adapted to the frigid environment that they live in, but their capacity to survive as the climate warms and changes remains a question. The biology of these animals was really shaped by their environment. So they inhabit the Southern Ocean surrounding Antarctica. And the, Anar the Southern Ocean is encircled by this very deep, uh, wide current called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that's shown here in these colors. So this current is the largest ocean current in the world. It moves 130 million cubic meters of water per second. That's more than all of the rivers in the world. South of the Antarctic Convergence, the Southern Ocean is very cold, and it has been cold for a very long time. For about 12 million years, the temperatures there have been less than 5 degrees Celsius. And because of the inverse relationship between oxygen solubility and temperature, this water holds a lot of oxygen. It's very uh, oxygen rich. And um, there's not a lot of competition in the Southern Ocean. It's thought that you know, there's not a whole lot of fish that live down there. There's probably enough food for everybody. Uh, I also want to point out on this slide that I, have, I work um, uh, at the US Antarctic Research Station that's located on Anvers Island. It's called Palmer Station. So if you think of Antarctica, this is the continent, as the head of an elephant, Palmer Station is off the left side of its trunk. <laughs> okay. So biologists have really been fascinated with the biology of Antarctic fish for a long time, trying to figure out how do they survive in these very, very cold waters, right? They're fish that are functioning pretty much the same as fish that you see in the aquarium here, as tropical fish or as, as temperate fish. And we've learned a lot about the specialized adaptations in these animals that enable them to cope with their cold environment. Number one, they have antifreeze proteins. So these are proteins in their blood that prevent them from freezing when they come into contact with ice. Not unlike what you put in your car, maybe not here in California, but certainly in Alaska, that prevents the fluids in your car from freezing. And Dr. Chris Chang, who's coming next month, is an expert in this area, and you'll learn more about these really interesting proteins. Their body parts, their proteins and their cell membranes, they also have, have changed during the evolution of these animals, so they maintain flexibility in the cold, so they still function. And these animals display what's called metabolic cold adaptation, simply meaning that many species are just as active at minus 1.8 degrees Celsius as fish are swimming off the coast of California. And this was noted even back in the early 1900s when Robert Falcon Scott's group was down exploring Antarctica. They went out to catch fish for their dinner. And they noted, hey, these fish gave really great sport. They were fun to catch because they put up a fight. And nowadays, uh, we capture the animals we work with, just like members of Scott's group, using uh, these big pots that we bait with sardines and mackerel and we deploy off the Antarctic research vessel, the Lawrence M. Gould. So I've told you now about some of the adaptations in Antarctic fish that have really helped them survive during their evolution in the cold. But we also see examples of disaptations in Antarctic fishes. These are characters or traits 
that are actually not as good as what their ancestral fish had. And the best example is the loss of the expression of the oxygen binding protein hemoglobin. So as, this, as the students already uh, ta taught to you, right, hemoglobin is that protein in our blood that has iron in it, so it makes our blood red. But in Antarctic fish that don't have hemoglobin, their blood is this milky white color. There are 16 species of Antarctic fishes shown here, or Antarctic ice fishes, and they all lack hemoglobin. And that's due to a, a, a mutation in their DNA so that they cannot express the proteins. These are the only vertebrates in the world that do not have hemoglobin. Until these animals were discovered, it was thought hemoglobin was really essential for vertebrate organisms. This is what their gills look like without having hemoglobin, so they're a stark white color. So as you've learned, hemoglobin, uh, this is a cartoon drawing of it. Uh, it's a protein, it has iron atoms at the center of it, and it's these iron atoms that bind oxygen, and the hemoglobin gets packaged up into red blood cells, and it binds oxygen in our lungs or in fish at gills, transports it through the tissues, and there at the tissues it's delivered and it's used to help break down the foodstuffs that we eat and convert the energy that's stored in food into the energy called ATP, which is used by our bodies to do work. Okay. Now, in ice fish that don't have hemoglobin, they don't have red blood cells, all of the oxygen is carried simply dissolved in their blood plasma, and as a result, they can't carry very much oxygen. They can only carry about 10% that of red, what a red-blooded fish can. But we know from studying these animals that there are lots of changes in their cardiovascular system that help them to deliver oxygen. So number one, they have a lot of blood. So they have about four times the amount of blood that red-blooded fish have. They also have big hearts compared to red-blooded species. So this is what the heart of a fish looks like. It's a three-chambered heart. Blood enters the heart through, this is the atria. It's coming from the body. It enters the atria. The atria then pumps it into the ventricle, and then it leaves through this structure up here, this rubbery, very flexible structure called the bulbous arteriosus, and that sends it to the gill. So these hearts are the same are from animals that are the same size, okay? and you can see that, that the ice fish heart is much larger than that from a red-blooded fish. They also have big pipes, large diameter blood vessels, to move, up, move blood through their circulatory system at a very high rate, and it also reduces the work that the heart has to do pumping this large volume of blood. And there's a high vascular density in some tissues, so especially those tissues that require a lot of oxygen. So what you're looking at here is the retina tissue of an ice fish, or the, you know, in the eye, and here is the retina of a red-blooded species. And these animals, they've been euthanized, and their blood vessels have been filled with a yellow plastic latex, so you can see the blood vessels. And you can see in the, ice, the eyes of the ice fish that really every nook and cranny is just jam-backed full with, a blood, with blood vessels to help deliver oxygen to that tissue. And for their hearts, which also require a lot of oxygen, I, they're very spongy, so this is a cross-sectional area of their heart muscle, and you can see it really looks like a sponge, and so that makes, it, it, it improves oxygen delivery to the heart. Okay. So ice fish were first discovered in the 19, early 1900s by uh, Norwegian scientists, and they first heard about uh, the so-called bloodlouse fisk, or bloodless fish, from Norwegian whalers who were working in Antarctica. And they went down there and saw for themselves and captured some. And the first uh, ice fish was described in the scientific literature in 1950 by the Norwegian scientist Johan Rud. And he said in that paper, he made this very um, accurate observation that one can only imagine in the very cold polar regions could a, a fish survive without hemoglobin. And that's because of this inverse relationship between temperature and the amount of oxygen in seawater. So as the temperature, the water temperature get, gets colder, it can hold a whole lot more oxygen. So it enabled that ancestral ice fish 
that had that mutation uh, in its DNA, so it couldn't produce hemoglobin, it could survive because it was swimming around in such cold water. If that kind of a mutation occurred in fish swimming off the coast of California, it's likely it would not survive and be able to pass its DNA onto its offspring. But the problem now is that Antarctica is warming, especially in the Western Antarctic Peninsula region where we work. In, uh, this area here is the fastest warming region in the Southern Hemisphere, and this map is showing changes in air temperature in different areas of Antarctica. And this is resulting in a lot of changes in Antarctica, especially changes in the ice mass. So most of the Antarctic continent is covered by ice, covered by ice sheets. And this figure illustrates the change, the mass change in the ice sheets that are covering the continent. So most of the loss in the ice sheets is happening in the Western Antarctic uh, region, as is shown here. And that's contributing to global increases in sea level. Okay. Another example, this is an aerial image of the US Antarctic Research Station, Palmer Station, where we work. Behind the station is a big chunk of ice called the Mar Ice Piedmont. And this diagram illustrates how that ice sheet has, how that glacier has retreated since 1963. And this is resulting in changes in the animals that live in Antarctica. So in the Western Antarctic Peninsula region, we see declines in Adelie penguin populations. We see changes in the abundance and distribution of phytoplankton. It's a little bit harder to figure out what's going on with fish because it's, so, it's a difficult region to study because it's so harsh. Uh, but what we do know is that warming is a problem for fish, and it's warming for a few reasons. One, as we mentioned, as the water warms up, the fish's blood is warming up because fish are the same temperature as their environment, can't carry as much oxygen. The other thing that happens as the water warms up is the fish become more active. Right? It's warmer, they're swimming more, and their bodies demand more oxygen. They need more oxygen at the same time that they can't supply it because there's less dissolved in their blood plasma. And this results in a, a mismatch between the demand for oxygen and the supply. And ice fish, this, for ice fish, it's particularly a problem because they don't have hemoglobin, right? They don't have this great storehouse of oxygen, so they're going to run out of oxygen more quickly. And that's, in fact, what uh, some of the first studies of temperature tolerance in Antarctic fish showed, is that ice fish are more sensitive to increases in temperature compared with red-blooded species. So this is a figure showing on the y-axis here, this is the, the, their upper temperature limit, or their critical thermal maximum. So this is measured by putting animals in a fish tank and warming up the water, and measuring the temperature at which they lose the ability to right themselves or hold themselves upright. They start getting tippy. Okay? And on the, um, on the x-axis here is hematocrit. So hematocrit is the percentage of your blood that's made up by red blood cells. Right? So maybe you've gone to the doctor, maybe if you're not feeling too well, and you've had your hematocrit measured. So for us, the hematocrit is somewhere on average around 40% of our blood are red blood cells. Uh, and maybe you've been, if you ever have been anemic, it means you have, low, you have a low count of red blood cells. And geez, you're feeling, usually you kind of feel kind of tired, not so good, right? Well, ice fish have zero, <laughs> have a zero hematocrit, right? They have no hemoglobin, and they're not staying home in bed. <laughs> they're still out there swimming around, uh, just as red-blooded fish are. So what this figure is showing, right, is that the higher the hematocrit, or the more hemoglobin a fish has, the higher temperature it's able, able to tolerate. Right? So ice fish have a much lower temperature tolerance compared to red-blooded species. OK, so we set out to investigate that uh, a little bit more closely using two species. One was this ice fish, Kinocephalus oceratus, and I'll ask you to say that five times fast, <laughs> uh, and a red-blooded species, Notothenia coreoseps. Right? So we hypothesize, okay, that, that ice fish, you know, they're less tolerant of increases in temperature because they're running out of oxygen. They're not able to deliver oxygen to their tissues as the temperature warms up. So we tested this by putting them in the tank and warming them up and giving half of the animals extra oxygen, right? So if we give them extra oxygen, 
they should be able to tolerate higher temperatures, right, if oxygen is a limiting factor, right? So that's what we predicted. So our results, we were wrong. <laughs> Often happens in science, you have this great hypothesis, you have this great experimental design, and you prove yourself wrong, <laughs> which is fine, because really that's what science is about, right, is figuring out how things work. So uh, what we found was that, yes, the temperature tolerance is indeed lower in ice fish, which was shown before, but adding extra oxygen, as shown in the, by these hatched lines here, right, it had no effect on that upper temperature limit or the critical thermal maximum. Didn't have any effect at all. So next we thought, well, maybe it's the heart. Maybe the hearts of these animals are different. Maybe that plays an important role in determining an org the, the organism's upper temperature limit, right? Our hearts are really so important in delivering oxygen in our body, right? Our hearts beat 100,000 times a day. It delivers 2,000 gallons of blood to our body in a day, right? It's especially important to deliver oxygen to your brain. So maybe it's the heart that's different and the heart that's limiting thermal tolerance. So we went back uh, using the same species, right? So our hypothesis was that heart function is limiting thermal tolerance. Maybe the hearts of ice fish don't function as well as red-blooded fish. So this time, we increased the water temperature, and we measured their critical thermal maximum. But we also monitored their heart rate. We put heart rate monitors on the fish so we could see how the heart was functioning. Okay? And, we and we predicted that the ice fish hearts would fail at a lower temperature compared to red-blooded fish. OK, well, we were sort of wrong again, <laughs> but a little bit right. So what these graphs are showing is temperature on the x-axis and heart rate on the, on the y-axis. So we warm them up, their hearts beat faster, 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 and then boom, they fail right, at that critical temperature. And they failed at the same temperature for both the ice fish and for the red-blooded fish. But what we did find was that the hearts became arrhythmic at a much lower temperature in ice fish. So they start misfiring, right, which is going to impact their ability to deliver to deliver blood and to deliver oxygen. So that was at a much lower temperature. And we also found that the hearts of red-blooded species were much better at maintaining energy levels, at maintaining levels of ATP that are required to keep the heart functioning. So we were uh, correct in that the ice fish hearts don't function as well as the temperature increases, and that likely limits their ability to withstand elevations in temperature. Okay, so what does the future look like? So we've been working on, on Antarctic fishes for, for quite some time now, trying to understand how they're tolerating increases in temperature. Other, many other science groups have done it as well, studying other fish. And in general, what we have learned is that Antarctic fishes are, are very stenothermic, meaning they, they tolerate a very small, narrow window of temperatures. They're not that tolerant of increases in temperature. Even when we increase the temperature slowly and just a little bit, they can't handle that, really. Right? These animals live by that adage, your genome does, like, use it or lose it. Right? These animals haven't had to respond to changes in temperature. Like, fish do and where the water temperatures undergo seasonal changes in temperature. And so their genome has really lost the ability to change and to change the physiology and the biology of the fish in response to temperature. So they just can't cope that well with warming temperatures. And it's also complicated because it's not just the water temperature that's changing. Oxygen levels are declining. The ocean is becoming acidified. And this is not only affecting the fish, it's affecting the entire food web. It's affecting the animals that they need to eat as well. Okay? The survival of these fish as, this, as the Southern Ocean warms will also depend on genetic diversity. You know, is there enough are there enough differences in these animals' genomes so that some of them might be able to cope with warming a little better than others, and they'll be able to survive and reproduce? And this is something we just don't know a lot about with regards to Antarctic fish. We don't know a lot of, about how much genetic diversity is. We still have so much to learn about the biology of these animals, which is why we need you. <laughs> and this was really illustrated by a, a discovery that was made um, by a group of scientists working on a boat called the Polar Stern in the Weddell Sea, which is off the 
eastern side of the elephant's trunk, or the Antarctic Peninsula in Antarctica. They had a camera down, just doing uh, surveys, looking underwater, see what they could find, and they found this amazing discovery of over 16,000 nests of ice fish. These, these are ice fish guarding the nests. These nests were about three uh, feet in diameter, okay? and it was an area the size of about six and a half football fields that these over 16,000 nests were found. And I have a video here. I'm hoping we'll play. So, so again, they launched this camera off of the polar stern. This is about at 500 meters depth. And these are all ice fish nests. <laughs> and these are the, the parents that are guarding the nests. You know what else they found down there? Pycnogonids <laughs> that were likely scavenging. And Waddell seals that were diving down there, probably feeding on the ice fish. Yeah. I just, I can't imagine like how exciting it must have been to be on that cruise and to see this for the first time. This was the largest breeding colony of fish ever discovered anywhere on Earth. This was a major finding. Yeah, my, my email lit up that day that that paper was published. Like, Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Oh my god, this is so exciting. <laughs> it's very, very exciting. And one thing that the authors noted in the paper when they described it was that this discovery really uh, supports the argument that we need to create a marine protected area in the Waddell Sea where these animals were discovered. A marine protected area is, a, is an area of the ocean that's set aside for conservation and science, so other anthropogenic human activities are very restricted in these marine protected areas. So right now in Antarctica, there are two marine protected areas. One shown in uh, yellow here near the South Orkney Islands, and the other uh, in the Ross Sea, right near the US Antarctic Research Station, McMurdo Station, which is here. And there are several proposed marine protected areas. So one in the Waddell Sea, that's where that ice fish breeding colony was discovered, and others shown in purple here that are off the eastern coast of Antarctica. Again, so these marine protected areas uh, protect uh, the organisms that live there from human activities, and I think many people are surprised to find that there is commercial fishing in the Southern Ocean. That as we've depleted fish stocks closer to home, that has increased pressure on the Southern Ocean um, and increased fishing activities. So right now, the two uh, there are three fisheries in Antarctica, but the two main fisheries, number one are for krill, which are shown uh, by the red dots. Okay. And krill is harvested for supplements, and it's also harvested for aquaculture to use in fish foods. And then the other fishery is for the Antarctic and the Patagonia toothfish, shown in green. And these fish are marketed uh, as Chilean, Chilean sea bass, you know, because the marketers didn't think toothfish sounds very tasty. <laughs> so they call it Chilean sea bass. It's also sometimes referred to as white gold, because it's very delicious and it's very expensive. So I have seen it up in the grocery store in Alaska, and it's about $30 a pound. Right. <clears throat> so the toothfish fishery, uh, I, as a fish biologist, I'm more familiar with that. And, and that has been a concern, because fishing activities have taken place in the Ross Sea, where scientists have studied uh, Antarctic toothfish. So that's the Antarctic toothfish, including, this is my collaborator, Lisa Crockett, that I showed on the first slide. She studied uh, the Antarctic toothfish um, before she earned her PhD. So that was one of the first uh, biology studies that she was involved in. <clears throat> and scientists have been studying them at McMurdo Station for a long time, since the 1970s. And they've been keeping track of what's the catch per unit effort, or how many hooks do you have to throw into the water to catch a fish? And you can see that it remains pretty constant until that fishery, until the, the first fishery opened for the toothfish in the Ross Sea, and then their ability to catch these animals significantly declined. So it's thought that the commercial fishing for toothfish in the Ross Sea has had a significant impact on the Ross Sea ecosystem. But that marine protected area was created in 2016, and we're hoping that with that, the, uh, that, that will relieve the pressure on toothfish and that those stocks will rebound. 
So the last thing I wanted to share with you tonight is just uh, like how important uh, teens are to science. So not only all the terrific teens that are involved in the Teen Science Cafe, but Lisa Crockett and I have also worked with teenagers uh, at the Lindblom Math and Science Academy in Chicago with their uh, teacher, Paula Dell. And these really creative, awesome students built us an underwater camera, which we dubbed Fish Spy. And we took it down to Antarctica and we launched it off the Lawrence M. Gould. So this is uh, uh, Paula, the teacher, and Lisa Crockett and myself watching the video of what's being collected by this camera that we deployed. And these were the students who we met with on Skype while we were down in Antarctica. And this is a short video that was made. So Polar Trek is the program that matched the high school teacher with Lisa and I. And there's Paula Dell, the teacher, getting ready to deploy Fish Spy. And these are the folks working on the Lawrence and Gould to help us deploy the camera over the side. really the first images that we collected of our animals living in their natural environment. There's, uh, so there's Nodothinia creoseps, that's that red-blooded species that we work with. It's also known as the yellow belly rock cod. Yeah. So we were very excited about this. We also deployed their camera inside one of the fish pots that I showed you earlier that we use for fishing. And what we learned is that the fish swim in and they also swim out. <laughs> so all these years we thought that it was a one-way trip for these animals, but no, they're much craftier than that and they were fishing, they were sorry, they were swimming out as well. So with that, I'd like to just thank you for all for your attention. Uh, and I'd also like to thank, uh, these are some of the folks that worked on the projects that I talked about tonight, uh, along with Lisa Crockett. And this, so this is the US Antarctic Station, Palmer Station. And this is the Lawrence M. Gould that we used uh, for our fishing operations. And I'd also like to thank really the, the support staff on the Lawrence M. Gould at, and at the, at the research station, because they're really instrumental in helping us to conduct our work. And all of our work over the years in Antarctica has been funded by the National Science Foundation. So thanks very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you again. Please give her another giant round of applause. So before we ask any questions, I just wanted to wave goodbye to all of our friends watching online one more time. So we will see you all later. If you have any questions, again, please email us or send in those questions, and that way we can um, mm -hmm. find you the person to answer that or even send it off to our scientists for tonight. So again, thank you, and we'll wave goodbye to everyone on our live stream. Thank you for coming. Join us again next time.